We begin with Daniel Dresner, professor of international politics at the Fletcher School at Tufts, who blogs at the Washington Post. Daniel Dresner, welcome to Beneath the Surface. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. So let's just start. I know that today the norm-shattering headline is on Dodd-Frank, but you wrote something, I think, two days ago that I thought would be a good place to start, and that's about how Steve Bannon um, what midwife the terrible immigration ban executive order. And so maybe we could just start with, you know, what role is, is Steve Bannon playing in the um, at Trump administration? He's a leading force, and, and, and maybe our listeners could just, you know, benefit from your understanding of where he came from and what he represents. Sure. Well, the first thing to realize is that whatever you think about Steve Bannon, he's not a dumb guy. Um, He has a CV that up until about seven or eight years ago would look like he would be the perfect person for a White House appointment. He served in the Navy. Um, Then he went and got graduate degrees from Georgetown and Harvard. And then he went to work for Goldman Sachs uh, and became rich, among other things, uh, because he got a small percentage of the Seinfeld profits, actually, um, by uh, brokering a takeover for Castle Rock. Uh, then, however, beginning around 2000, the mid-2000s, uh, Bannon became much more of an ardent nationalist and then eventually um, took over the Breitbart uh, website and news service from after Andrew Breitbart passed away. Uh, so he is thought to be one of the leading folks of the so-called alt-right, alternative right, um, which generally espouses a much more populist nationalism and some would even say ethnic form of nationalism uh, that's relatively hostile to the notion of immigrants. Okay, so this is very important. And I know that um, at the convention he was interviewed famously and, and said that Breitbart was in fact the intersection or campaign central in a way of white nationalism and the Christian right or the alt-right. And, mm-hmm. and it seems that that is so far afield from what we normally get in, you know, in, in an administration. Of course, there's nothing really normal this time around, or maybe you think there are a few normal things, but... Go ahead. <laughs> well, I would say a few things. There, there has been this strain in Republican circles for some time. Um, there are ways in which what Steve Bannon says echoes a little bit of what Ron Paul says in terms of the sort of libertarian regulation slashing side of things. And he also sounds a lot like Patrick Buchanan, uh, who, when he was running back in the early 90s, generally railed against globalization and warned that immigration was actually uh, crippling the United States. So th- there is this strand, but it has not been nearly this prominent. Um, you'd have to go back, frankly, to the days of Robert Taft or pre-World War II to find this kind of, of school of thought this prominent within Republican Party circles. And the other thing to realize is that Bannon right now is particularly powerful because he's in the White House, and Trump has been remarkably slow at getting not just his cabinet confirmed by the Senate, but to my knowledge, there has actually not been a lot of appointments or announcements of undersecretaries or deputy secretaries of state or defense or what have you. And so as a result, the rest of the administration is shorthanded, and Steve Bannon has uh, the proximity to the White House. He's got walk-in privileges to the Oval Office. This gives him a tremendous amount of influence over the President of the United States in the first month of his administration. Well, and then on the other hand, you just mentioned that maybe he's more like Buchanan and then went all the way back uh, to uh, prior administrations that were isolationist in nature. But there seems to be a kind of crazy hybrid going on here because on the one hand, it's America first, it's nationalist, and somewhat isolationist in terms of trade policy overview, at least as we heard it in the campaign. But then on the other hand, there is this militant a push to rid the world of radical Islam or ISIS, and that's been pretty scary as the way that we've, you know, seen the uh, uh, Iran put on warning, I think it was, or on notice yesterday. And, mm-hmm. you know, and perhaps an offhand comment of of uh, President Trump to Peña Nieto that uh, he's got, they got bad hombres there and they're going to send in troops if he doesn't take care of it. And and these are things that we're not used to hearing just offhand normally unless it's off mic, you know, from from a president. This time we do. So where, where do you think Bannon fits in there in terms of crafting uh, not just the domestic policy but um, – the foreign policy, and I guess in a way I'm asking you, is he Trump's Henry Kissinger? Right now I think you would have to say the answer is yes. 
Um, the very fact that Bannon was put uh, uh, to be uh, a participant on National Security Council meetings uh, and the principals' meetings, that's a highly unorthodox move. Um, sort of, you know, predecessors to Bannon, like, let's say, David Axelrod for the Obama administration or Karl Rove for George, H., for George W. Bush, were never allowed to um, have standing invitations to NSC meetings. Uh, so in that sense, I, I think Trump clearly trusts Bannon. And I think it, it's consistent with Trump's sort of personality style, which is Bannon, because he's independently wealthy, and because he, among other things, sucked up to Trump during the, general, during the primary phase of the campaign, um, has earned Trump's trust. So it's not entirely surprising uh, that Trump relies on him more than sort of the traditional GOP foreign policy community, which, to be fair, uh, were pretty... Uh, uh, consistent and steadfast in uh, opposing Trump throughout both the primary and the general phase of the election. Well, then let's go from there back to the uh, you did this uh, blog post on um, two theories about why Steve Bannon midwife such a bad executive order. And it has been an mi- unmitigated disaster. I was one of the many who ran to the airport the next day and was swept up immediately at LAX by a crowd of, say, I'm, you know, you couldn't tell because we were marching around, but it looked like at least 10, 20,000 people, which is quite unusual at a moment's notice. This has hit hard. How did this executive order, or how, what is your theory about how that came about? So there are two explanations. And, and generally, when, when the federal government screws up, uh, like this, you can always rely on two explanations. One is incompetence and one is malevolence. So the incompetence story is that Steve Bannon might be a really smart guy um, and he might have many talents, but he has never served um, in the White House before. His only previous government experience was in the Navy and that was back in the 70s. And you can take the smartest person in the world and put them in the White House for the first week of an administration, and they will screw up massively just because they don't understand things that they do that even during the campaign might not have made much of a story suddenly become a huge story. Um, And it seems increasingly clear that Bannon um, and Stephen Miller, who's sort of the the policy guru, who I think did the actual drafting of the the executive order, um, kept things on a very close hold. They didn't consult with most of the other salient uh, cabinet departments, and so as a result, they drafted this order, which was incredibly sloppy, um, and you know has led to all kinds of blowback. And had they consulted with, let's say, the Department of Homeland Security or the State Department or the Defense Department, um, they could have at least sanded the rough edges off the executive order, even if it had still been controversial. So that's that's the first story. The second story, though. Um, says that Steve Bannon is a smart guy, and maybe he knew this was going to create all kinds of blowback, and maybe that's what he wanted, um, which is to say this order, in, in terms of substance, manages to harm both American interests and American values. It doesn't really in any way add to uh, our national security. What it does do, however, is create what is often called security theater, which is much like TSA in airports that seem like it's all a big rigmarole and is designed to make Americans think, well, if we have to go through all this, then it must be making things safer, then a lot of Americans, particularly those who already supported Donald Trump, will look at this kind of executive order and think, that's right, he's actually blocking you know, people from uh, countries that, that even the Obama administration designated um, as zones of, of terrorist activity, and that will make us safer, even though... We know that since 9-11, if this executive order had been in place before 9-11, it would have stopped exactly zero terrorist attacks between then and now. Right. So this is a very important point, and of course it's fueling all kinds of conspiracy theories as well, that this is a kind of shock and awe while they're doing other things sort of, you know, under the, the radar. Uh, but but j- what else is concerning you, let's say, in these very first days of the administration with, uh, as you said, you wrote this great thing about, you know, being exhausted, be- just trying to keep <laughs> up. You know, And we all feel that way. I, I actually have to just say that everyone I talk to is completely completely politicized, completely activated, reading everything, and at the same time wanting to put their head in the sand as running out to every demonstration. Right. Well, my personal fear is that I'm going to become so exhausted that by the end of this term I will look like Steve Bannon, which is something I'm trying to avoid. Um, so, you know, that, that, as I said, it, it's, a, uh, it's a constant thing where you're just constantly paying attention to, you know, what the latest news is. You know, we're at the point now where if I wake up in the morning, I sort of have to check Twitter to see what idiotic thing Trump said um, overnight. The more substantive concern I have is, in some ways, 
the degree of both the incompetency and uh, the counterproductive policies that are being put forward. Um, if Steve Bannon does what he wants to do competently, then you're going to see a world which suddenly has much higher barriers to exchange between the United States and the rest of the world, both in the terms of, of trade, in terms of tourism, in terms of movements of capital, and in terms of immigration. Um, and I think that will be a net negative for the American economy, and it will actually cause you know, someone who's a, uh, a college professor the United States is generally thought to be a great magnet for the best students in the rest of the world. These kind of orders are guaranteed to cut into foreign applications, Absolutely. Uh, which is a big problem because higher education is a major uh, export sector for services. Uh, so that's, the, that, that's if this is all if implemented competently. If, as it seems increasingly likely, it's not going to be implemented competently, then my real fear there is that Donald Trump is going to try to overcompensate by continually trying to divert attention um, from the myriad screw-ups with more and more bombastic rhetoric. You know, think about the phone call with uh, the president, with the prime minister of Australia, or the phone call with the president of Mexico. Neither of which, these should be easy phone calls. (laughs) These should be things that you do without any kind of, you know, blowback whatsoever. Instead, they've created major news stories. And what's really disturbing to me is the degree to which foreign leaders are already beginning to discount when Trump has a temper tantrum. They're basically treating him now like a five-year-old. Um, and that's not good for the United States, because there might be the occasional time where you want the president to issue a credible threat. Except that if the president continues to make bombastic threat after bombastic threat and then not follow them through, then he's going to, it, 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 there comes to a point where he's just crying wolf, and where he'll have to he'll issue a threat that he actually does want to be believed, but everyone will ignore it, and then we wind up stumbling into an actual war. I'm speaking with Daniel Dresner. He's a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and a regular contributor to what's called Post Everything. It's the Washington Post blog, and you ha- really have to ca- look at it daily and I suppose even bi daily or twice a day to see what's going on. But right now, Daniel's been talking about really what you wrote, I think, in how much weight will Trump's words carry on the world stage and the fact that uh, internationally, heads of states and their foreign ministers and uh, leaders are beginning to think that they have to distinguish between what's serious and what's just a temper tantrum from Trump. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. In which case, I mean, the the people to look at, and this will be really interesting, is it is possible that, that foreign leaders will discount Trump's words, but they will take, let's say, Secretary of Defense James Mattis's words more seriously. Mattis was recently, you know, is now on a, a Far East trip and has said things in Japan um, and, I believe, Seoul, uh, South Korea, as a way of reassuring our South Korean and Japanese allies. Now, it appears that those words had the kind of salutary effect that you would want them to have. So it is possible that maybe Trump himself, but Trump's cabinet secretaries, will wind up being able to at least minimize the damage. And if Mattis issues a threat, then maybe that threat will be seen as credible. But we are in a very odd world when the Secretary of Defense is taken more seriously than the President of the United States. <laughs> and, okay, so this is, in the last, let's say, three minutes, let's talk a little bit about what that might mean in policy, because it isn't just Trump who campaigned on a certain, you know, set of, uh, a kind of w- viewpoint, but we are now governing with the most extreme Republicans literally holding, you know, in the Congress and in um, and in the Senate. And today we see that the you know, New York Times headline is something like, well, um, they're quietly trying to do nothing on the health care right now. There's no replacing in, in, you know, in store and so and no repeal in store, I should say. So on the one hand, we get these radical proposals from Trump during the campaign. And on the other, we have kind of the opposite coming forth from the Congress. How do you see that playing out? Well, the way this is going to play out is that, you know, there are certain things that Donald Trump can do as president. I mean, he can issue executive orders. There are certain changes. He can make the immigration executive order actually had real-world compli- uh, consequences. But a lot of the other executive orders that made news actually weren't all that significant. So the order arguing for the creation of the Mexican wa- you know, the wall uh, towards the, bo- the Mexican border, or the one that directed agencies to slow down Obamacare implementation. If you actually looked at the executive orders, they don't amount to much. Congress has to do something. Um, Congress has to pass bills in some ways to enact a, a large part of Trump's uh, agenda, things like infrastructure spending and tax cuts and what have you. The interesting question going forward is the degree to which, as those bills are written, 
the key driver of them is Donald Trump, or is it the you know the House leadership and the the Senate leadership in uh, among Republican members of Congress? Because they have very different visions at times. Um, one of the and I think that the the two areas I would say to look at closely to see which one is actually in charge is infrastructure spending and U.S. policy towards Russia. Because those are areas where the Republicans in Congress disagree very strongly with the Trump administration. Republicans in Congress don't want to increase infrastructure spending all that much, and they want to take a hawkish position towards Russia. Trump, on the other hand, wants a big, beautiful infrastructure bill, and he also continually seems to say nice things towards uh, about Vladimir Putin. Um, those are the two areas where I would look at to see which wing of the Republican Party is exercising the most influence going forward. And just and finally, really quickly, Steve Bannon said that they were going to have a $1 trillion uh, infrastructure spending uh, program that will bring jobs for generations to come that will dwarf what uh, FDR did. Do we take that seriously? I think they're going to try. I, don't, I think there's no chance in hell that uh, the Republicans will actually pass a bill along those lines. Okay, thank you so much for taking the time today, uh, Daniel Dresner. I hope you'll come back because, as you say, the outrages or, let's say, the pronouncements are coming, you know, on, at such an accelerated pace that we have to pay attention and we, at the same time, get exhausted from doing so. Thanks for joining us on Beneath the Surface today. Thank you. I've been speaking with Daniel Dresner, professor of international politics at Tufts. It's in the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and he blogs at the Washington Post. He's written a number of books. Go to the Washington